I, I heard a recording in progress. Thank you, Guy. Um, so we have uh, both uh, Rushna and Kai uh, together with us for an exciting discussion on non resective surgery. Thank you so much, Kai and Rushna, to, to join. After a terribly hot discussion, we decided that Kai would go first. Uh, so, Kai, would you please share your screen and present your case? Thank you so much. And please just uh, stop by whenever you think a discussion is needed or, or good enough, and just uh, let's go ahead. Okay, thank you, Arthur. Uh, I'm very honored to be here and uh, show this one case I, I choose to present to you. And uh, uh, so my name is Kai Lehtimäki. I'm a functional neurosurgeon. I do a little bit of spine and uh, uh, low grade tumors as well, but I, I'm mostly a uh, functional neurosurgeon with DPS, vagal nerve stimulation in epilepsy. So that's that's basically what I, I do the most. So um, one thing I think it's important for you to know that in Finland, uh, resective surgery is centralized to Helsinki and Kuopio. So there are two other university hospitals that do the resective surgery. So our center is more like focused to, to neuromodulation. So uh, I go straight to this case. And uh, this is not terribly difficult from surgical point of view, but I think this is interesting and challenging case as you will, as you will see. So this is just to demonstrate the path of neuromodulation and uh, I will discuss the surgical details uh, motivated by this case. So, so this is the guy, this is 21 year old male and he suffers from almost daily seizures. And uh, MRI, as you can see here is cortical dysplasia, very uh, widely distributed uh, uh, typical findings and which we will see here in the, in the uh, temporal parietal area. So there are a lot of these pathological uh, areas. And uh, in the family history, no epilepsy, development has been normal. And the first seizures came 2011. And the EEG, surface EEG, showed uh, frontotemporal discharges. And they, of course, started with, uh, with the anti-epileptic medication. And they further changed later these two to other drugs, but I won't go into this drug treatment uh, a lot here. So what next? 2015, there was this uh, uh, formal diagnosis of focal epilepsy with clinical manifestation of left-sided seizures with broad neocortical involvement in surface EEG that correlates with MRI I, I just showed you. So uh, quite early, we did resective surgery evaluation at Helsinki University Hospital, and they uh, answered that this is not a candidate for, for surgical resection because it's simply too wide network and too, too widely distributed pathology there. So two years after diagnosis, there was discussion what to do next to go for VNS or DBS, and uh, our professor of neurology, Jukka Peltola, discussed with the, with the patient and they decided to go, go for DBS and anti-nucleus DBS in this case. They continue to work with the drugs. You will see them here, but I won't go into the details uh, in this case either. So diagnosis 2015, decision 2017 to go for DBS and April 2017, we did ANT DBS surgery for him. Um, and we do that always in general anesthesia. And at that time point, we did use Medtronic 3389 electrodes. And the only available uh, IPG at that time was Activa PC. So just before I go to the planning and the details of the anterior nucleus uh, DBS planning, just to remind you about the target. This was the original target from the Santa trial and, and Robert Fisher group and work from 2000, 
from 2010 actually. So it is five to six millimeters lateral, zero to two millimeters anterior, and 12 millimeters superior. And the red dot here should be the should be the visual target of the anternucleus center. So uh, this is now a uh, planning uh, screenshots from our case. So here you see the left hemisphere and here the target is four millimeters lateral, which is close to the um, kind of atlas based target. But now we're a little bit more anterior. This is three millimeters anterior and 12 millimeters superior. So here we see pretty nicely uh, left anterior nucleus in these steer images that I have. And this is the coronal reconstruction from the axial images. And you see pretty nicely the nucleus, which is our target here. So uh, uh, I usually plan it so that the trajectory goes a little bit in the lateral aspect of the nucleus because all the white matter that goes to cortex is a little bit here in the lateral that forms the anterior and superior uh, thalamic radiation. So I like to be a little bit in the lateral aspect of the nucleus. So this is pretty close to the uh, atlas based target on the left hemisphere. Uh, and if you look at the entry point uh, where we, we go to the start the trajectory, and this is the point that there's always choroidal vein here, and there is a thalamus striatal vein joining the, the choroidal vein, and they form together the internal cerebral vein. And this vein, usually defines the entry point. So we decided to go a little bit posterior from that vein, and that basically defines that we are a little bit posterior from the coronal suture in this case. I would like to go from the coronal suture, that's kind of the standard default entry area, but in this case, the vein simply um, made us to, to go a little bit more posterior. And this I, is the, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt, uh, just, uh, your images are inverted to the conventional yeah. radiology. Right? In this brain lab, uh, in this brain lab uh, software, uh, left is in left. So this is this is uh, left hemisphere here. That's okay. correct. Thank you. So uh, this images axial and path uh, eye view is now at the level of thalamus roof, and here you see the vein. This was thalamus striatal vein, and it's just joining the superior coronal vein here. And and this is the safety margin that we have. We usually need to go a little just posterior from that vein to, to get right into our target area. So this hemisphere was pretty straightforward and simple, simple like that. So let's have a look of the right side. So here is the uh, thing that we have learned and we have published this in 2015. And there are many other papers that have published the same uh, result that right hemisphere and right anterior nucleus is always a few millimeters more anterior. So you cannot use the same coordinates for both hemispheres. And I think this case demonstrates the uh, variation in between uh, thalami uh, in the left and right side. So here we are five millimeters lateral. This is now four millimeters anterior, which is four millimeters more anterior than the atlas based target which was sometimes even at the mid commissural plane. So it's so zero millimeters uh, in front. So we are four millimeters more anterior than in some of the Atlas cases. So I think this is pretty much that would be good to, to, to recognize. And now we are at 14 millimeters superior. So we are a little bit higher up as well. Again, I think our images are, are nice. I very much like to work with these images. You see pretty clearly anterior nucleus here, this coronal reconstruction, so it's mammalothalamic tract and the nucleus as well. So this is not coronal image, but this is reconstruction from this two millimeter fake steer image. And it's still, it, it's beautiful. I think I would do surgery from these reconstructions as well. So uh, this is the target. And uh, the trajectory here is a little bit more complicated because you now you see more of the plexus veins uh, filling here. And again, you see, this is the point where the thalamus striatal vein and the cordial vein join. So this is the corner and turn. We need to go just posterior from those veins. And this basically decides how posterior your entry point must be. 
And in this case, we went even more posterior to get behind that, that veins. So, so, and if you look now the level at the roof of thalamus and the window, vascular window here. So this is how close we need to go to these veins to get a nice access to the target that we have defined. So, uh, so uh, here is a little bit more images. This is, uh, this is true axial image. So this is our target. So this is a visual target. I usually start from the coordinates. I put in the Sunday original theoretical coordinates, and then I start looking at the images. And then I already know that I'm going to move much more anterior, typically two, one or two millimeters in, in front. And especially on the right side, we need to go even further anterior. So this is this is visual visual surgery, but I like to start from the from the numbers, and then I just look the images and I start work work with the with the target. And this is now the true coronal image, the only true coronal two millimeter thick uh, coronal image I have in this presentation. You see pretty nice anterior nucleus here, and you see the mammal thalamic tract coming from the mammal bodies. So so. Uh, especially on this hemisphere. So this is pretty easy to define if you have high quality MRI and the correct sequence. I can share our imaging protocol, whoever is interested. So this is not as difficult when you have high quality images. So basically this is the message from our centers in, in many meetings I've been talking. So this is get much easier when you have high quality good images. So this is a, a brain lab elements uh, that we use now for, I don't know, three years at least for planning. So this is 3D reconstruction of the, of the final position of the, of the leads. So this purple one is anterior nucleus. We have two 3389 lead contacts inferior to anterior nucleus, but they are really close to the mammal thalamic tract, as you can see. So I have plenty of choices to stimulate here. I also have two lead contacts just in the, in the anterior nucleus. The green one here is fornix. So this is surprisingly close to fornix, actually, the, the anterior nucleus. I, I, I recognized that quite recently. So, so this is nice to show how close is the relationship here. And the left hemisphere, you see two lead contacts nicely in the anterior nucleus and two a little bit deeper, very close to the mammal family tract junction area, which many people think is the, is the correct target area. And that's because that's easy to see from the planning images as well. So that's nice uh, anatomical landmark. So this is the final implant in, in this case. And uh, here you see the trajectories. So they are pretty close to, to, to midline here. So that means I usually do a bicoronal type of incision here, just over the both. Uh, uh, entry point points area. In Parkinson's disease, we are a little bit, little bit more lateral, so I do two different incisions, but in epilepsy case, I usually do only one here to, to open uh, enough to, to do both of the bar holes from that uh, same incision. So uh, this is the kind of slide that shows the principles, what we do at our center. So this is actually published in the epilepsy surgery techniques uh, 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 book as well. So we have learned that the thickness of anterior nucleus is approximately four millimeters. And it's 10 millimeters, uh, it's 10 millimeters from anterior to posterior direction. So this is published many, many years ago. Just wanted to bring that up here. This is the rule that we still follow actually. So we try to define the surgical target point here in a way that that's kind of 3.5 to 4 millimeters from the CSF surface. I like this distance to be around 4 millimeters for a reason I will explain in a minute. So that will be very close to mammalothalamic tract uh, endpoint, just below the ND. So this is the surgical target point here. And if you implant 3389 electrode, metronic 3389 or 3387 in a way that you put the very center 
of the electrode. So between one and two to this surgical target point. So you will have, I'm sorry about this uh, animation goes a little bit too fast. So you will have two lead contacts, two and three from 3389 in the anterior nucleus above the surgical target point. And if you use 3387, you will have one lead contact just right in the middle of anterior nucleus and the uppermost will be a little bit in the CSF, but a little bit in the ANT as well. But you will have one nice contact in ANT and the surgical target point is right in the middle of the, of the electrode. So these are the uh, basic rules that we, uh, we follow. I see uh, hands raised here. Should we Arthur go for these questions now or or yes what you want why, to do? Why not? Why not? Who, who is I don't see the hands up though. I see Hadi Lukman raised hand in my screen. No. Okay, maybe I go further so we can probably go to discussions in the end. So this is the very latest information uh, I've uh, working with for the last few weeks. So this is the more, the, 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 yeah. Let me just interrupt. If, by the way, if the audience has any question or something to to contribute, you can use the, the chat or the Q&A and we are gonna represent it or even bring you to the panel. Okay. So just to give you an idea what's going on in these implants. So I have analyzed basically all European implants from Medtronic registry uh, that has 160 implants, so more than 300 leads. So I've gone through this data many times. I'm going to present this information in, uh, in uh, South Korea in September. Just to let you know that from these uh, 320 leads, in my opinion, as a neurosurgeon, I thought almost 90 were misplaced, which means almost one third. Uh, the misplacement that's typical for transventricular implants is that they end up in CSF. So they end up in ventricles and swimming there. They are not in uh, thalamus or not in anterior nucleus. And this is 8.5% of the transventricular leads are in the CSF. That's pretty high number in my opinion. The other uh, typical misplacement error in my, one could say error that gets repeated is that extraventricular lateral approach, which I saw here, they are not in ANT and that's almost one third of the extraventricular implants that are not in the target area. The problem is that from the lateral approach, the nucleus is a little bit hiding, it's bulging a little bit to the CSF. And there's this thalamus striatal vein, and that's quite difficult to, to get leads, in fact, in the anterior nucleus. So many times I see functional neurosurgeons to give up and they think, okay, I cannot do that. I cannot implant from lateral approach to anterior nucleus. So I'm happy to put it close, a little bit under or inferior to anterior nucleus. They're just lying below the ANT and people seem to be happy with that kind of solution. And that's why we have quite a lot of implants that are not really in anterior nucleus. And to, this is one of our cases. This is not the case I started with, but this is another case. I have misplaced two of those leads myself in CSF. And if you look this X-ray and you follow the line of the electrode, you see that it's deviating to midline a little bit in the end. Whenever I see this little bit of turn here, I know that this is not the natural nucleus and this is swimming in the CSF and in foramen of Monroe. This is after in a revision surgery next week, I wanted to make sure that it's right in the middle of the, of the area. So I needed to, to, to correct that, that lead next week. So uh, in order to avoid uh, leads end up being in CSF, which is the most typical error in transventricular uh, lead implantation. This is our technique that we have worked, and this is what we do at the, in our center. So if you use Lexel system, 
uh, and you follow the method that we use for movement disorders. And uh, the devices that we have, and I think this is the equipment that most people use. And this is Inomed 10, uh, 13 universal guide. And the idea is to do micro recordings of the subthalamic nucleus or GPI. And that's why it's 10 millimeters short to leave room for, for micro recording and registering uh, of the neural tissue. And uh, we use the same stuff for ANGDBS as well. But this uh, design is problem for, for, uh, for epilepsy because of transventricular uh, technique. So this is what's what's going to happen. And, uh, and uh, I just need to remove a little bit. So basically, the CSF travel plus the distance you go to the thalamus, this is 13 millimeters. And uh, this is what's going to happen. So the blunt uh, DBS lead with only the wire inside and especially if, if this angle is not 90 degrees, it's very easy to jump in the, in the foramen of Monroe and the lead won't go in the thalamic tissue properly. But this, is, this keeps happening. It has happened to, to me many times and it, it's keep happening in, in other centers as well. To avoid this, this is what we do uh, at this moment in our center. So what we do is that we use this device uh, lead depth stopper and we use 208 so we make the lead a little bit shorter uh, in movement disorders we use this but now we put it in the 208 so the lead becomes eight millimeters shorter and still I plan the very center of the lead right in the target at the same time the Lexel mic to drive holder we put this instrument eight millimeters deeper. So the whole device goes a little bit deeper, but the lead will be eight millimeters shorter. So this means that the net effect is zero. But the only difference is now that the guide tube will go eight millimeters deeper than the kind of traditional uh, default use of, of, the, of, the, of the system. So, uh, let me demonstrate what this means. So this means that the inner stylet, so the very tip of this universal guide, will be two millimeters above target instead of 10. And uh, it means that it's two millimeters inside thalamus if the target is four millimeters from the CSF surface. So that's why I think it's important to have this four millimeter rule in planning. That's why I, I like that. So so. The outer tube, so the thick one here, will be five millimeters above target, leaving only one millimeter of CSF here. So the thick one will not go to thalamus, but it will be just one millimeter above, and the inner tip will penetrate the thalamus roof, and then the final deep lead will go nicely just to the parenchyma. So the lead will not be in the in the CSF more than one millimeter distance. And this is close enough to avoid this deflection of the lead to, to, to a CSF. So this is something we have done now for, uh, for a few years. So this was the technical part. I have a few backup slides in the end for discussions about trajectories and uh, anatomical details if there's any questions about that but uh, let me go to the to the case to the end and then we can talk about surgery so uh with dbs we started with the most cranial contact here 3 and 11 default parameters so there was decrease in seizure severity but still had almost daily seizures so we activated two and three from the left side and 10 and 11. So we had two active contacts, both sides. 2019, we have programs A and B, where the B has one minute on and one minute off, which is very much uh, kind of a, a cycle that speeded up from the five minutes off, which is the program A here. Then we end up having a program C, which is continuous stimulation. 
And there's a little bit of extra benefit, extra effect from all these programming maneuvers here. But we are not happy with the, with the response still. And uh, we make a decision to go for VMS on top of anti-nucleus stimulation. And uh, at that time, the Percept PC uh, device is available for Medtronic. But we also know that the IPG voltage had already decreased to 2.71. So we decide to put VMS and at the same op operation change the DBS IPG. But two days, I mean, look at this, two days before surgery for DBS battery replacement and VMS, the guy goes into status epilepticus and come to our hospital in a, in a, in a very bad condition. Uh, we note also that DBS IBG is at end of uh, elective uh, replacement indicated. It's not dead yet, but the voltage has uh, reduced uh, a lot. And this is interesting because that's something we can now do with the Percept PC device. And this is a recording from the uh, intensive care unit. This is surface EEC showing a, a discharge and seizure here. And this is Percept EEG. So this is deep thalamic recordings time matched with the cortical EEG. And you see that you can also record the seizures uh, from, from the DBS device that is implanted chronically. So this is a kind of nice uh, technical. This is not easy to do. We have people uh, focused on this uh, and they could do it, but this is possible to record seizures from the thalamus in chronically implanted devices. And we could demonstrate that in this, this very case. Okay, uh, uh, we achieved burst suppression using propofol penthal and, uh, and uh, then we have the new uh, ANT DBS device in place. And once we go with high amplitude stimulation, we could control status epilepticus using ANT DBS and ketamine, which is a little bit weaker anesthetics compared to the propofol and pentothal. So we had a little bit of improvement here, but still he had a lot of seizures, a lot of discharges in EEG, he was unconscious. And we go for VMS in the, in the early uh, June 2020. And we go very fast uh, from a few in a few days to, to therapeutic level of 1.5 milliamps. So kind of acute uh, uh, ramp up of, of the VNS device. So we see that seizures and discharges are less frequent. So we are getting forward with these maneuvers. And the first time he starts to obey commands, so there's a little bit of neurological improvement. He becomes conscious at this time point here. Uh, late in the, in the June, no discharges. So we have first 24 hours without, without seizures in, in late uh, June 2020. And uh, it goes to step-down unit to intermediate care unit and to, to traditional ward, hospital ward early July. Still seizures, but no situation is in control. And he was discharged in the middle of, of, of July, 2020. So this is a case with uh, all approved uh, neuromodulation devices uh, employed. We had a little bit of status epilepticus, nice recordings, and uh, still he's having seizures, but we could somehow manage the very difficult uh, situation with the neuromodulation uh, uh, devices that we have. So uh, this was the case to, to open up the discussion. I'm, I'm ready for whatever you might have in your minds. Thank you so much, Thank Kai. Uh, wonderful presentation. I think uh, I will open this uh, to discussion. Maybe if you want to share the screen, it will be better for I can stop sharing now. Yes, perfect. Great, uh, great case. Uh, fascinating, especially with the way you were able to handle the, the status uh, that occurred in this patient. Just curious, um, on your ENT recordings uh, after the VNS was implanted, could you see the, the VNS artifact uh, when it was periodically firing or as you ramped up the, the voltage? 
That's a good question. I think we did those recordings just before the VNS was implanted. Uh, so that there was a time period where we had only uh, ANT DBS, and we I think there was a one week or something uh, before we implanted the VNS. But I, I'm pretty confident that if you just record at the time of VNS is activated, you will probably see it. Uh, to get nice EEG from that device, it's it's very complicated. You need really people who understand the devices and JSON files, and and it's a lot of work. So basically, it's not that easy that you just take your tablet and you see the EEG, but you need to to store the raw data and export, and use software to 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 make it visible. So so it is complicated. But there we have people who have learned this. But you will if you can time lock the surface EEG and the device EEG uh, in a way that you can put the timelines identical, then it's it's very nice, but it is complicated. And we have people who have managed, managed to do that. You basically need to have some kind of uh, artifact uh, induced. I think they have some kind of AC-DC converter or something. They induce an artifact every now and then, and they can use and find those artifacts and then they can put them in the in the same timeline. But but it was not uh, obvious and self evident from the beginning. So so, but I, I see no reason why not to see VNS uh, activation free from that. So most likely you can do it. I see Jorge with a hands up. Yeah, Karen, thank you so much. This is a great talk. Uh, I have a question. So. so Regarding the implantation technique, what's the value of the micro recordings? One question. Uh, and the second question is, do you use impedance check to yeah. tailor the position of electrodes and confirm that you are in the CSF and not yeah. in the talent? Yeah, we have done all of this in our history. So we first did we did some uh, injected contrast to CSF a few times when we learned that's not working. And then we did micro recording and we still do every now and then if we have live surgery courses, we, I like to do the micro recording because that's kind of demonstrative what's happening, but uh, we don't do that uh, much anymore if we do not have kind of uh, uh, courses going on. Because the problem is in micro recording that if you have nice trajectory, to the very center of, of our apex or tip of the anterior nucleus and you hit right in the middle. You will see from CSF to anterior nucleus and you start seeing firing of the neurons. And then you see, okay, this is exactly the superior border of the nucleus and you know where to place your contacts. But the problem is that, and we have done the mistakes so many times, I don't want to repeat that anymore. So if you're a little bit lateral, just two or three millimeters lateral, or let's say two millimeters later, there's very heavy white matter uh, uh, system just lateral to ANT. And if you hit that with your micro needle, you won't see any spikes. You are in the thalamus and you can go one millimeter, two millimeters, three, and even four millimeters or even five without seeing any spikes. Uh, there's very difficult. I mean, you cannot see the difference from CSF to white matter in that equipment that we have. So we thought many times, okay, we are still in the CSF and we implanted the leads way too deep. So we are below the ANT level and we learned that quite late. And that's why the micro recording can be misleading. It works beautifully if you are right in the middle and the tip of the nucleus, but it's slightly lateral, you can ruin everything. So that's why we don't do that anymore. And at least we do not change our plan, how deep we want the implant to lead. We still stick to the plan, where's the final depth of the lead. We do not change that according to micro recording. And then it affect in the post-operative images. It's, I like the area, just the white matter lateral to your nucleus. I think that's the area we need to stimulate because that's the fibers to single ohm and anterior thalamic radiation. I think that's the area we need to stimulate to activate networks. So the, the white matter the, the, is good the, target, but micro recording might be very misleading. That's why what, we do not. And, and what about the impedance? Impedance measurement. Uh, we actually just 
published paper. It's a, approved now in neuromodulation. It should come any day public. So during surgery, you need to do uh, bipolar measurements. And uh, if you have leads that kind of 1.5 millimeter contact, and then you have 1.5 millimeter uh, insulation, then you have 1.5 millimeter lead. So the resolution is it's not very great if you do this bipolar measurement of, of impedance. So we have done this, that we have a lead, and we put it in the thalamus and we measure all the impedances. Then we go one millimeter deeper and measure again. So you can actually see that the impedance between lead contacts gets higher when the deep lead goes deeper and deeper to the thalamus. But the impedance measurements works nicely when you have implanted the whole device and you can do device measurement, monopolar type of measurement. And it shows pretty nicely that the most cranial contacts actually have very low impedance. It could be five or 600. And then the deeper ones will go to 1000 a little bit more. So the final uh, impedance measurement monopolar from the device works well, but during surgery, I mean, it's it's not very useful during surgery. So we are now back into image guided thing. So we plan very carefully how deep we want to implant the lead and we stick to the plan. We do not mess during surgery. And that's where we get very consistent, good positions of the lead. We try to avoid all the kind of changes and uh, too much thinking during surgery. So we plan and then we do it. And usually that that's the best way. Great. Uh, Very good question. As we wait for, do, do the panelists have any question or could we open Tatiana? Just go ahead. Tatiana. I think it's fine. You, you, Thank you're you for muted. a great talk. Thank you for a great talk, but it's fine, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tatiana? Hi, Dr. Kai. Thank you. Hello. Yeah, it, 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 it will be easier for, you, for him to hear you if you unmute. I can I hear think it. I, well, yeah. yeah, you did. Yeah. I did already, right? Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you have a strategy for the patients that do not improve that much, which is your first parameter and the final ones? That's a good question. So, so far, if we are not happy, we will check the, the lead where they are. So we want to make sure that we have selected the uh, right contact. So we usually uh, activate second contact in the ENT area. So typically the only improvement we have learned in now more than 10 years is that the patients that gets improved, they got activated the most cranial contact. That's the only kind of pattern we have followed is that where we, we typically start at a little bit too deep contacts that are a little bit in the inferior part of anterior nucleus or even, even below the anterior nucleus in the very beginning. And, and when we started to activate the most cranial one, that's where we saw many patients become responder from non-responder. And the reason why I think many people uh, are a little bit afraid of activating most cranial contact is that the impedance values could be 500 or 600. I think they are a little bit afraid that this might be swimming in the CSF. But we just published this paper and the ANT is so close to CSF. It's only four millimeters. It's very thin, actually. Four millimeters is not much. So it's so close to CSF that any contact that, that's in anterior nucleus will have lower impedance values that you are used to see in movement disorders, where you have 8, 900, 1,000, even more. ANT is too close to, to CSF, they will be lower than expected. And I think this is the reason why many, 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 many doctors select kind of uh, to make sure that they are in the thalamic tissue, they select two deep contacts. They don't look the images and they look the impedance values and they select the ones that almost in the dorsal medial nucleus or somewhere. And that's why they don't get the results. And we did that as well. And then we kind of took courage to activate the most cranial ones that have low impedance values. And then many, many patients improved. We have not seen that much improvement in frequency or amplitude. You could actually stimulate too heavily as well. 
So I think it's still the anatomy and images and the understanding what's the expected impedance value from A and T located contacts. I think this is the uh, only pattern yeah. we have learned. Okay, I see Guy had some something to mention. Are you there, Gary? I don't see you. Oh, yeah, yeah perfect. I, I just actually I had a, I had a couple of related questions for Kai, and thank you for that beautiful presentation with your experience. So you you showed us that you had to go quite posterior with those two electrodes to to find that junction in the axilla right behind the venous meat of the thalamostriate yeah. and choroidal yeah. veins. And have you ever had situations where the venous anatomy where you just can't find the best trajectory? And have you in those situations? I, I know that some centers come more laterally for with a, with a lateral frontal approach and Mayo Clinic has published a posterior trajectory. And I was wondering if you have experience with either of those other trajectories. And then a related question is when you have very large ventricles, how do you work around that? Are you still okay going transventricular or do you find a trans cerebral trajectory? Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just like to mention that we will need the, kind of quick answers, Kai, because we need to move yeah, to the right. stage. Yeah. Um, we had, in the very beginning, uh, we tried the extraventricular, I don't know, six, seven, eight times, something like that. And none of them were in the anterior So we missed every time when we tried extraventricular, which means frontal lateral approach. So we were not able to implant any contact in there. So we have operated a few of those cases again. So in the beginning, we thought it's not possible. And then we simply implanted the transventricularly. And the vascular window is not big, but still we were able to implant. And I have never seen bleedings in that area. So I think we will find some uh, trajectory every time. The posterior one, parietal, I have not tried. It is an alternative, but uh, so far I have found always the, some road transventricular and I, big ventricles, I don't think it's a problem. I, I will still go transventricular because I want to be consistent and, re and do everything in the same time uh, repeatedly. I like an autistic way I, I want to do. I, I'm a little bit like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I do have some questions too, but we need very, very uber quick answers because Roshna, Roshna is getting anxious yeah. uh, I, I, I see uh, um, the first one is very quickly you had a patient with left lesions and you did it bilateral why did you do it bilateral and not unilateral yeah that's uh, that's approved therapy I mean uh, I don't think one sided is is enough because the connections are bilateral as well I don't think it's that simple that the only hemisphere is sick and then you need to 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 treat that. I don't think we even discussed or thought about that. So, so they, it has been always bilateral uh, treatment. And uh, we also learned that the cases that we have only one lead good position and the other one was missed. We did never that those patients improved. The only improvers were bilateral in nice positions. So that's why always bilateral. The other issue is uh, this patient seems to have uh, temporal lobe epilepsy coming from the left side. Would you trade the ANT for an hippocampal DBS? If that was approved, because it's very strict uh, in, in Europe, and basically you cannot do anything off label. Uh, it's a long story, I won't go into, into that, but just to mention, I have been in a local police office for a few hours uh, discussion about these topics. So I won't do anything off label uh, ever, basically. Okay, and the last one, uh, cycling versus continuous. Do you have a, we have seen a, a, improvement. a present yeah, opinion? Would you, would you move everybody to continuous or keep them cycling? That, that's a good question. That's, that's possible. A little bit lower amplitude, continuous, good, good work equally well. So, so I think that's possible that we have not done that. We stick to the approved uh, systems quite a lot according to our experiences in the, in the past. Thank you so Thank much. You. Wonderful case and wonderful discussion. And now, Roshna, it's time to put you to work. So please share your screen and uh, sure. go ahead, please. This will be a tough act to follow. This was, um, you know, such a such a wonderful uh, wonderful case. Just gonna go full screen. Oops. Let's not give everything away. 
All right. Um, you, 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 you're, you're not giving a spoil from your ESTM presentation, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, let me know if during the course of the presentation anybody has trouble seeing or hearing me, but um, uh, I'm Rashna Ali, I'm a functional and epilepsy neurosurgeon uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, excited to be a part of this uh, wonderful uh, consortium and uh, to talk about an interesting case where we, where we took um, a little bit of a risque approach. Um, I have no relevant disclosures. And uh, you know, for the for the students in the audience, I just quickly wanted to you know run a few slides uh, outlining the the different neuromodulation techniques for epilepsy that are approved. Uh, take you through choosing the stimulation uh, strategy, and then just share a little bit of evidence uh, combining neuromodulation techniques before we start with the case presentation. So I'll keep that very very brief and very quick, so we can save the meat of the conversation for the case itself. So vagus nerve stimulation uh, was the first one that was approved, um, at least in the U.S., and results were were good. You know, all neuromodulation techniques are considered palliative, and with vagal nerve stimulation, seizure frequency decreased to about fifty percent in fifty percent of patients. Uh, seizure freedom was only seen in about 5%, 25% patients who underwent the implant didn't receive any benefit. And um, as most of you are aware, there were uh, stimulation-induced uh, side effects like hoarseness, voice changes, pain, cough, and dyspnea. Um, the next one to, to, to be approved was responsive neurostimulation after a double-blinded RCT uh, confirmed efficacy and safety, and uh, it basically works by acutely terminating seizures by disrupting synchrony through implanted electrodes. These can be duct electrodes or they can be small surface electrodes, uh, and uh, you need to have two epileptogenic foci uh, to implant this in. Um, after two years, the mean seizure reduction with this device was about 40%. At six years, it improved to 70% in frontal and parietal seizures and about 50% in folks with multi-lobar um, onsets. And then the, the nine-year outcome data shows about 75% median uh, seizure reduction and 35% uh, achieved more than 90% um, seizure reduction in, in a six month uh, period. And 28% had at least one period of six months uh, where they were seizure free. And lastly, um, DBS was most recently approved in the US uh, a few years ago after the, the Sante trial uh, showed um, efficacy and safety uh, where there was a median decline of seizures um, at 40% at, uh, at the initial um, analysis. And this um, decline continued to improve over time. So it was 56% at two years, 69% in five years, 75% in seven years, and about 16% uh, of the cohort uh, reported seizure freedom. There were no major adverse events, which is important when we're, when we're evaluating any type of new therapy, uh, but the stimulated group did uh, report uh, a slight increase in depression. However, subsequent studies have shown that these, these were, these were patients who were, um, you know, prone to depressive episodes, uh, even prior to prior to implantation. So the reason we we choose interglamic uh, stimulation is because um, this nucleus is the integral part of the PAPE circuit, and it interferes with propagation of epileptic activity through this particular circuit. It interferes with interhemispheric spread uh, through the diencephalic control pathway, so uh, it helps with the secondary spread. And because of its, its placement within the PAPE circuit, it's most effective in, in temporal epilepsies. So, um, you know, 
continuous use of, of this technique um, and demonstration of consistent relationships between cortical and thalamic activity um, across patients would advance our understanding of the epilepsy network because, you know, uh, Epilepsy is considered more a, of a network issue as opposed to a, 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 a focal cortical uh, disorder. Now, when we, when we discuss what type of stimulation strategy we're going to choose, um, there, there are things that help you decide whether you want to do closed loop versus open loop stimulation. RNS is the only form of closed loop stimulation that's available, whereas open loop includes both DDS and uh, vagal nerve stimulation. So with closed loop stimulation, there's a lower burden of stimulation throughout the course of the day. You're talking minutes uh, per day. There are fewer stimulation related side effects, but of course those can vary depending on uh, your targets. It's found to be less disruptive to cognition and mood, and um, it collects and stores chronic ambulatory um, EEG data that can then not just be useful in measuring seizure burden, but response to changes in different anti-epileptic medications, any behavioral modifications, and is also helpful in characterizing any new neurobehavioral uh, spells. On the flip side, with open loop stimulation, there's higher burden of stem uh, seizure. But on, on the other hand, seizure onset zone localization is not needed. And uh, it can be effective in poorly localized or multifocal um, seizures. The program is gen programming is generally easier um, and it's less burdensome on the patients because there's no need for patients to download and transmit their data the way they have to, to do with, uh, with closed loop stimulation. And then combining neuromodulation techniques. Um, you know, Kai's case was a perfect example where DBS was combined with VNS, uh, both RNS VNS as well as DBS and VNS combinations have been studied retrospectively. Data from multiple centers has been pooled. And, uh, you know, one of the, the biggest takeaways was that most patients with dual device implantation remained active with their VNS treatment because typically they had a VNS um, implanted before and then either had a DBS or an RNS implanted. Uh, but the VNS continued to help uh, their, uh, their seizure control, suggesting a more synergistic effect when two neuromodulation techniques are combined. Uh, there's also a report of a hippocampal RNS followed by uh, anternucleus thalamic DBS in a staged manner where the uh, anti-DBS suppressed hippocampal activity during stimulation, epileptiform activity during stimulation. And then the neurophysiological effects of uh, anti-DBS were found to affect brain networks extending beyond the seizure foci um, using uh, uh, connectivity studies. So this brings us to, to our next case, as you can, most of you can uh, imagine, I'm going to talk about combining neuromodulation techniques to, to treat a patient. So um, we had a 46 year old right-handed woman with uh, refractory epilepsy for many, many years. Um, she had uh, a pre ictal um, or aura, which consisted of changes in visual perception. Um, she had focal aware seizures that started with an electric sensation inside her head and uh, in the back and then radiated anteriorly, lasting a few seconds. Uh, she had focal impaired awareness seizures where she was unresponsive, had very typical uh, or elementary automatisms, uh, non-clonic uh, non right hand movements, paraphasic errors afterwards, and post nose wiping. And then she had these rare bilateral tonic clonic seizures that occurred uh, out of sleep. She had no significant past medical history, but she did have a significant family history where um, her niece had a febrile seizure and her sister died uh, when she was very young from seizures. She tried and failed um, multiple anti-epileptic medications at, at very appropriately tried doses. Her phase one monitoring or video EEG showed um, three 
ictal discharges associated with clinical seizures that started in the left mid anterior temporal uh, area. Uh, there were frequent sharp waves um, in the mid uh, anterior temporal region, uh, region in the left, uh, intermittent rhythmic delta activity, as well as uh, some irregular delta activity was seen. She underwent the, the typical um, advanced imaging that, that most of our patients with the with epilepsy would go through. So her SPECT system showed hotspots with seizure activity. Uh, and these were um, ictal specs uh, that showed uh, seizure activity uh, uh, on the left side uh, in the mid anterior left uh, temporal lobe laterally, uh, as well as uh, involving mesial temporal structures uh, went quite a bit posteriorly and uh, uh, towards the more anterior portion of the left occipital lobe as well. Um, her MRI brain showed, uh, as you can see um, on, on the images in the, the lower column, heterotopic gray matter along the, the left occipital horn. Her fMRI showed co-dominant language and her, her MEG was non-lateralizing. So I'll open it up to, to the panel at this point in time. I know the the the, the title of the talk kind of gave things away, but um, what in your practices would you consider as, as next steps? Would anyone resect or ablate the left temporal lobe or just go after the heterotopias? Would you jump directly to RNS? If you were to do RNS, what would you target? If DBS, you know, what would you target? What would you, what would be the, the nucleus you would go to? Um, or do you want more data? Would you consider phase two monitoring? And if yes, where, where would you like to place the leads? Any volunteers to discuss that? There is no wrong answer. Let me tell you that. <laughs> well, it's, it's like there's no right answer either. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, uh, what was the neuropsychology of this patient? Um, so uh, memory was, they found a good memory bilaterally, but there was sign of left uh, hemispheric dysfunction. Mm, but memory was good. Memory was good on both sides. Any suggestion from the panel? In, in one way, from the first, you could sort of consider a section, but I think the extensive uh, heterotopias definitely speaks against uh, a large temporal lobe resection. I don't know if uh, I, I haven't seen the images too uh, closely, but maybe you could have some combination of laser ablation and, so, and such things. But it, I do agree that a huge resection would probably uh, be too cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive damage to the patient. So probably not a resection. Well, I and even just, though her language was co-dominant, she, she had uh, more representation uh, on the left brain than she did on the right. So co-dominant with, with left predominance. Just to open up to the, to the, to the possibilities, uh, uh, I think there are still people who would favor some time of resection in this kind of patients with periventricular nodular, it stinks periventricular nodular heterotopia, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, from a practical, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's not, it's not only at the posterior quadrant, it goes, uh, to the anterior and mid uh, temporal lobe too. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, we gave up uh, offering resections in patients with temporal lobe, epi dominant temporal lobe epilepsy and normal memory. So at least uh, in our place, we would not offer res large resections. There are some groups, I think maybe Jorge, if he's still there, uh, uh, would like to talk about it, but there are some people who would investigate with SCG and uh, find, uh, let's say, the most active nodule and then ablate it with radio frequency or laser ablation, uh, which would be uh, an option. Some groups 
claim that the results are pretty good, that with small laser ablations, you, uh, you, you can just make them seizure free. Um, other groups claim that they, have, they can have get a transit benefit from this kind of uh, lesioning, be it our radio frequency or laser ablation. And then after a couple of time, they just start seizing again. And of course, there are other groups that would go ahead with uh, neuromodulatory techniques, uh, whatever you have available. Some would use RNS, some would use hippocampal DBS, uh, some of, would use anterior nucleus DBS. Uh, it looks like if you have a Hummer, everything is a nail. So it's uh, uh, whatever you have, they, they will try to use, including VNS, which is something that you can always use, but it's kind of coward if you don't investigate uh, adequately uh, your patient. So I think you, you've you got um, uh, a, a nice bunch of options. You, actually, we have just uh, such a case in the MIU right now with SED recordings and uh, seizures are coming from everywhere. And mm -hmm. uh, she's not he's not going to end in a resective or ablative procedure anyway. But uh, I think it's open. It's going to vary from center to center. Jorge, you 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 do it with SEG and and uh, ablation, right? We do for this case particular, Arturo. I think um, the next steps for the treatment it depends on the mapping of the epileptogenic zones. I think we do have several options here. It seems to me, of course, we need to go through more details. This is uh, anterior perisuvian. Uh, uh, epilepsy um, with the type of semiology with the scalp EG at least with the pictures that we saw with the temporal and also central temporal areas would suggest involvement of the perisivian areas and uh, and then the periventricular nodule uh, which is very posterior too so there is uh, enough incongruence in the data that we have that I'm not sure if the teratopia is responsible for the seizures, if is anterior perisuvian, if the hippocampus is involved, in addition to that, this is a dominant side. So mm -hmm. we need to tailor a little bit what would be the extension of the epileptogenic zone in the location mm -hmm. that will define the treatment. So that's why in our center, we'll do most likely uh, an SEG exploration for this case. I, George, Iwami, I agree with you that we might do it. Can, can you show your face, Berto? Or yeah, there's, sorry. or no, you're, sorry, or sorry, you're sorry, hiding sorry. for any. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, <laughs> in uh, in one way, I I could agree that uh, uh, it could be good with a, a SCG, but I think you mentioned the cognition. I think that is the most important thing. That whatever decision you do, just be extremely careful with her dominant side, and that's the that's the important thing. That is why I think respect i mean maybe the SEG could tell you that you could do a limited standard anterior temporal lobe section but i doubt it but it's very important as you mentioned to take uh, to consider her her cognition since it anyway is the dominant side so that's the that's the big question really not to help her and not to sort of make her a double loser which could be a uh, significant risk in this case well, democracy says it's good, it's good to have choices. So, Roshna, you have choices. Go ahead. Wonderful. So, so I picked uh, the safest route. Uh, we proceeded with the phase two monitoring. Yes. Um, so, uh, we targeted, um, as most of you mentioned, uh, the left occipital horn heterotopia. Uh, uh, good coverage of the left-sided mesial and lateral temporal lobe, and some mimickers, including the insula and the cingulate. What we found was there were two spontaneous seizures with onsets in the left uh, heterotopic gray matter. However, she did have one spontaneous seizure with onset outside of the coverage area. So she had uh, her clinical um, onset before we picked up uh, electrographic onset. Um, and there was very quick spread to the posterior hippocampus. That's where we detected the electrographic activity uh, at, the, at the initial outset. 
And then she had one seizure that was induced with stimulation of the amygdala and anterior hippocampus. Uh, but this did not start with her typical visual um, aura, but otherwise had typical, uh, typical semiology. Uh, but didn't have her aura and then that focal, focal aware component. So to summarize, um, you know, this is somebody who has, uh, based on semiology, left hemispheric origin, uh, uh, medically refractory epilepsy. Our video EEG showed uh, left temporal ictal and interictal activity. Her MRI is abnormal because of the heterotopias. Uh, the CISCON showed um, increased activity in the left temporal lobe as well as uh, around the perihetrotopic areas. Her MEG was unremarkable. Her fMRI showed uh, bilateral speech, but left more than right. Uh, Neuropsych demonstrated uh, left hemispheric dysfunction, but she did have co-dominant memory and her memory on the left side was actually pretty decent. Um, her phase two showed uh, two seizure onsets in the heterotopic area, but one seizure, even though it had quick spread to the posterior hippocampus, it was outside of the area that we were recording. Um, and then uh, with, with stimulation, uh, we were able to provoke seizures, but they did not, they weren't her uh, typical, her typical auras and her typical focal aware component was missing. So, you know, the biggest fear was, you know, we're, it's, it's, a, it's a larger multifocal uh, type of uh, epilepsy. You know, we are recording from uh, one of her major seizure foci, maybe uh, adjacent to her second, uh, but we're not, uh, we're, we're missing part of that, uh, part of that network. And, um, because with stimulation, we weren't able to induce her typical aura, um, uh, we might be missing the, that sort of aura and that leads into the focal aware component a little bit. So then with, with that information available to you now, uh, what, does the, what does the group think? What would be, what would be the preference in the situation? You know, we can once again talk about resection or ablation, but you know, based on the discussion that we had uh, previously, this is her dominant um, hemisphere. She's got good memory on the side. Um, uh, you know, speech might be at risk as well, even though she's co-dominant for speech. Um, but you know, even then, could we consider a more focal resection or a more focal ablation? Um, jump directly to neuromodulation. Um, if neuromodulation, then which technique would you use? And then, um, you know, uh, particularly Arthur, since it's left hemispheric, if you were to do DBS, would you just do one nucleus or would you do a bilateral implant? You know, Kai and Arthur are certainly interested in, in hearing opposing views. Kai, would you like to comment? Yeah, um, I remember having similar cases with the MRI findings, um, pretty identical to this one. And we, I mean, you cannot basically do other than approved therapies, but the kind of, we have, but but we shouldn't, but uh, we have used ANT-DPS for similar MRI findings. And uh, um, we have, if I remember correctly, 70, 80% degrees in seizures, the very first case ever operated in anti-DBS at our center had actually similar uh, periventricular retrotopias bilateral, actually. So, so, so we have similar cases. I think the results are they are responders, and uh, if I quickly go through the connectivity of ANT, because we always hear about these fornix mammillary bodies, mammillary thumb track, ANT single one, loop, the circuit of babes, but there is a lot of fiber systems. There are 15 actually other fiber systems that I, we are just beginning to learn and publish about their very heavy connections to amygdala from inferior thalamic pedunculus. There is also visual uh, cortex, um, occipital um, connections from ANT. So visual cortex is one of the 
cortical uh, areas that A and D is connected. And uh, hippocampus and amygdala are the biggest ones. So, so uh, they are theoretically connections into, into that area as well. So, but I think in ANTDPS, what we treat is the uh, somehow breakdown in uh, level of consciousness. I think we don't treat the focus or what's happening in there. I think we are treating, uh, avoiding the seizure to cause impairment of awareness. I think this is what we do because the patients re report that these, since they are aware of seizures, they don't get, they lose, they don't lose their consciousness and then they improve from that kind of uh, way. So I don't think we are stopping the focus to work, but we are just spreading or minimizing the spread of the seizures. I think this is what we do in ATDBS. So I would go for ATDBS, but like me is everything looks nails because I have only one hammer and <laughs> that's ENT, DBS or, or VNS. So, so, so okay. uh, that would be my choice. Yeah. Jorge, would you ablate the SEG defined foci or, and show, um, your, and show yourself? Sure. So <laughs> I, this is a, it's a complex case, um, of course. And, uh, as I understand, we saw some seizures coming from the periventricular nodule and other seizures that were not uh, completely localized. Is that correct? Correct. So uh, two came from the, the electrode within the heterotopias. One had clinical onset that preceded uh, electrographic onset. So we don't really know where it started, but we picked it up uh, initially uh, in the posterior hippocampal lead. Yeah, so I would take uh, one step back and uh, I on, on, honestly, I think in your options of treatment, we, I have the impression that we feel obliged to do any sort of surgical treatment for this patient, which is not necessarily true. I think we also need to discuss the option of not doing anything for this patient because we don't answer the fundamental questions that is about where the aplatogenic zones or zone is located. So mm -hmm. to me, this there is a possibility that we need to revisit this case to understand the position of the electrodes, why the seizures were not localized, and if there is more questions to be answered in a re-exploration of this patient with a more correct hypothesis of localization. I think this is another option for this patient. Mm -hmm. right? I think you had a very good three. point. I think you have a very good point there, George. Sometimes it's really, really important to say stop and say we don't know him, know him enough to treat this patient. And whether mm -hmm. that ends with a complete stop or a re-evaluation, that may be different. But that was, I think, a very important comment. There is also the, the issue of uh, if you are a believer on the seizure onset at the nodule theory or not, uh, some would say that they know for sure that seizures are coming from the nodules. Others are going to say, we are not sure about that. They appear to come from the cortex. Other teams would say, well, it's interaction between the cortex and the nodules. Um, but uh, maybe this is also a decision, but uh, I'm not sure if adding new invasive studies will make any bigger difference there because you already know it's multifocal. Um, and the decision would be either to do nothing or to go for uh, a non-lesional a non, a non procedure, a neuromodulatory procedure. Uh, we are a kind of more versatile in terms of what we can offer. Uh, we would certainly start uh, with uh, hippocampal DBS leads in uh, unilaterally uh, in, in such a patient. Um, uh, it would make more sense than A and T because this would be more direct connectivity. Uh, this could be done with uh, DBS hippocampal leads or RNS leads in tandem, for instance, just to cover the whole thing from the posterior part to the anterior part. But I cannot foresee um, any major resective procedure. 
Although I do agree that there are many centers that would over ablative uh, laser or RF procedures at the main nodules that you have defined using SCG. But we are getting curious, Rushna. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, very, very similar discussion to, to this that we had at our epilepsy conference when we were uh, discussing this patient after all of her data was, uh, was evaluated. Uh, we, we didn't think that uh, a resection or ablation with her diffuse uh, um, onset zones uh, would be appropriate. So we kind of took that off the, off the table and we were left with neuromodulation options for her. Uh, phase three was discussed. Um, the patient just simply was not interested. She was in the EMU for her phase two for over three weeks, uh, just about lost her mind um, and was, was not going to consent for, for further recordings. Um, and typically in our practice, we would do a staged approach. You know, we knew that whether we were going to do RNS targeting the heterotopia and perhaps, you know, a mesial temporal electrode, um, meaningful improvement, um, you know, would be, would remain to be seen, you know, because we, we did capture that one seizure that wasn't part of our coverage. Uh, we talked about doing um, antithalamic nucleus DBS for her, just going right in and, and targeting the, the network as a whole, because at least we know that this is, um, this is a left temporal plus sort of a network. There was no concern that there was anything uh, happening on the, on the right hemisphere. We presented both options to the patients um, and she um, wanted sort of a one and done surgery. Um, we then discussed this further at our, at our conference and uh, we initially wanted to do closed loop RNS where we wanted to implant uh, the left temporal, uh, mesial temporal, put a depth electrode there, put a depth electrode along our SEG electrode trajectory in the left uh, occipital heterotopias, and then put one lead into the left NT. Um, but of course, with, with our current restrictions, only two of those would, would remain to be active. And um, the patient wanted, um, didn't want any leads implanted that weren't going to be active or weren't going to be active for a very, very long time. So it got us thinking, we, uh, we, we wrote up an IRB, approached our institution to uh, enroll her um, in, in, in a first of its kind uh, surgical uh, implantation trial at our institution where we did both. So this is this is where you know I expect uh, I expect a lot of uh, criticism and and critique, but the way we justified this was you know the highest risk of uh, complications comes when we're implanting the the intracranial leads now whether it's you know, the three leads that are connected to the same system or three leads that are connected to two different systems, a risk of intracranial hemorrhage would be, would be similar. Um, you are adding a little bit of a higher infection burden when you're implanting two devices. We did do it in a, in a quick staged fashion, but that's, that's certainly a, a consideration. Um, and then, then lastly, the cost that's that's associated with this, you know. Even with with good insurance coverage, there was there was a hefty cost uh, right up front. But you know, we were able to to justify that uh, comparing it to the the cost that's associated with uh, untreated uh, refractory epilepsy. So she underwent a left. And these images are, are radiographic, so left anti-DBS to affect. Uh, uh, a larger neuromodulatory effect through through PAPE circuit, and then a left hippocampus and periventricular heterotopia depth electrode RNS targeting uh, the, the 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 seizure onset zone and the the posterior hippocampal area that had the initial early spread. Uh, she she had we we have about six months actually nine months data at this point in time. Um, so her focal aware seizures where she was having multiple a day are down to one a month. 
uh, impaired awareness seizures that she was having, you know, one to five every month or down to one in, in the last six month period. She hasn't had any uh, uh, tonic clonic seizures. And uh, we're, we're learning a lot about about her uh, through this implant. Um, you know, we see the, the appearance of the 145 Hertz AT stimulation in her RNS um, leads. We, we frequently abort seizures with, uh, with her, with her RNS uh, implantation. Uh, these are the the parameters that we've been using, and as you can see, there's there's been um, small gradual changes, particularly in in the voltages. You know, we started off with the high uh, voltage stimulation. She had, she had some uh, some side effects, some nausea, uh, some anxiety that got provoked. So then we brought her down, and then slowly ramped it ramped it up to three volts, where she's tolerating it. Uh, really be really well uh, with continued improvement in seizures. So, you know, in conclusion, uh, this was uh, this was a less than traditional approach where you know most people would have done a stage approach or probably just use closed loop stimulation. Um, but combining these two techniques is feasible and safe. Our patient um, has had about 85% improvement in seizures. This does suggest some possible synergistic effects on, on thalmocortical pathways. And of course, we need, we need more studies to determine um, efficacy and, and broader uh, clinical implications. So that I can unshare uh, and open it up to, to discussion. Thank you, you muted, Roger. Thank you for a really interesting and, and difficult case. It, 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 really, it really implies lots of thinking and, and re-evaluation, I think. It's very interesting. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. And I, I went completely opposite to what Hori was suggesting, like do nothing. I'm like, no, I'm gonna do everything. Um, there is a question from the audience, an improvement in the left hippocampal function? Um, in terms of uh, neuropsychiatry? Me me memory, yeah. Uh, so she is scheduled to undergo her uh, one year uh, neuropsychiatry eval soon, so we'll, we'll know more. Um, would you, can you, have you think about it or done it uh, to turn the ANT DBS off to see if all you're getting are, is from RNS? Uh, I understood that uh, you can uh, get the action potential from the ANT stimulation in the in the mesial region, meaning that that's where it's going through, right? Since you already have an RNS electrode there, uh, have you tried to turn the ANT DBS off? So um, I, I I didn't show that data, but we've had uh, washout periods of both where um, initially um, only, used, uh, only used RNS, then introduced uh, DBS into the mix, and then for a little while, shut off stimulation on the RNS, just left it to, to detection settings, and then did a washout period there too. And she benefits from both. So either therapy alone, and this is what we found in retrospect, is either therapy alone, helps improve her seizures. But we do see a synergistic effect where, uh, if you remember initially during her programming, we had to bring her voltage down. And right before that, uh, her DBS was shut off for a long time and there was an increase in her, in her seizure frequency. Um, that's why we slowly introduced uh, DBS therapy into the mix again and slowly went up onto the voltages where we were able to sort of maximize the benefit that she was getting. So she's benefiting from both, but it does seem that with both therapies active, she is getting the, the best benefit than she would have with either therapy alone, which is great because if she didn't, it would really suck for us. Wonderful. Any other option? Tatiana, Jorge, any insights? First of all, congratulations on your case. It is very interesting. And um, I was wondering after yeah, uh, 
you could uh, see where the seizures are coming from. If you could tell if the seizures are more from the occipital heterotopus or more from the temporal lobe. So uh, in, in terms of the, the distribution, it's about 60% uh, or more from the heterotopia. Um, and but we are detecting um, seizures from the from the left uh, mesial temporal or left uh, hippocampal lead about thirty to thirty five percent of the time. Okay, and the ANT worked for both. Can you do uh, you think you can tell that? Oh, with the you mean with the washouts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we haven't been able to parse that data out um, yet. Uh, okay. But we're in the process of writing it up. So, you know, hopefully uh, once we have that analysis up, we'll be able to share it with everybody. Yeah, but I think the most interesting part will be that you'll be able to see what really happens with the ANT stimulation and we'll be able to record everything. So congratulations. Mm -hmm. Jorge, does this data improve our knowledge about her or it just as lost as before? Um, I, I'm still puzzled about uh, the rationale about this case. Uh, I think uh, there is some rationale, but I, I, again, the, the, the concern that we didn't record the seizures and uh, we don't know exactly, that, that's a concern to me. Um, I think we still have uh, relatively long-term follow up for this patient. Uh, I hope she or he will continue to do well. Um, but I think, unfortunately, we, we still are a little bit lost in the mechanism related to how DBS and RNS and putting all things together, how it affects the seizures is, is still very puzzling to me. Uh, I think uh, this particular patient did, you know, it seems like she's doing well. And I, I congratulate for the group for that. It's a challenge case, but um, I think uh, we, we do have a lot of work to do in order to understand what is the role of this combined procedures. And uh, again, most likely to me, the most important is to understand how the decisions are organized. Uh, I, I just, I have one question for, from, from Rashna, is that from how, what's the percentage of seizures for that patient that are not detected by the RNS device? Right now so, that we have a chronic uh, implantation, a chronic recording for this patient, what is the percentage of seizures that are not recorded at all by the device? So um, her auras are, are typically missed um, and some of her focal aware seizures um, are not uh, detected by the RNS, okay. but not all of them, which is, which is also, uh, Puzzling. Yeah. Okay. But all her focal impaired awareness seizures are uh, are detected. Thank you. Congratulations, Rishna. And this leads to to another unrelated issue, Rishna. That that is uh, the use of chronic uh, electrocorticography in, in in the near future, as far as we get better hardware, better than RNS, because we, we, uh, we usually put patients in one or two weeks in the EMU, and now we know that they might take three weeks to start seizing at the other side or in the old, other region of the brain. Uh, right now we have uh, another one that uh, has bilat this bilateral thing, and in the first week everything came from the left, and the second week everything coming from the right, and in the third week uh, every, it's coming from everywhere. So it's likely a, there is there will be likely a place for chronic uh, electrocorticography with, uh, for this kind of patients in in the near future when uh, better hardware become available. Such an interesting case, Roshna and Kai. Thank you so much again uh, for bringing your case. Uh, we, this has been an exciting. We could keep discussing these things uh, for hours. Uh, it, it's so interesting and help us to look into the future. Uh, I'll just, uh, for those who don't know about it, uh, ESTM is in early July in Geneva. 
this is going to be our first face-to-face -face meeting after the pandemics. Uh, most of us are truly excited to be able to see each other face-to-face -face and uh, to join forces to better understand and treat our patients. This being said, thank you again for being here today and have a good rest of your weekends. Thank you so much. And now we'll open the post webinar meeting. Thank you. Did you send the link, uh, Otto? For I, I'm for doing this as soon as I finish the recording. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, guys. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye bye.